as we uh, conclude this evening our study that we've been doing on Wednesday nights of looking at how to have victory in our lives, we come to the last letter of the acrostic when uh, the very first week when we started, I asked you to jot down the word victory, and uh, then we defined each one of those letters in the word victory, and uh, seven steps to gaining victory in our Christian life, and gaining victory over sin, gaining victory over uh, maybe habits, if you would, gaining victory over things that we need to gain victory over, and we looked at, first of all, that the first step is to vigilantly guard against sin. And, uh, do as well to guard against sin and just remembering that sin is out there and sin is real. Sin exists and sin affects each and every one of us. And so we must vigilantly guard against sin. Letter I was imagine the consequences. And, you know, there are consequences for our actions. And oftentimes we don't consider that step. We just do things not thinking about, uh, how's that going to affect me later on? Right. What's that going to do? And uh, We illustrate it this way. I mean, I, I know at times we've said some things come out of our mouth, and as soon as they come out, you think, man, I wish I could take those back. And you wish they were tied to a rope so you could grab them and shove them back in real quick, but you can't do that, can you? Once they're out there, they're out there. And so we must imagine the consequences. Let her see. We have to cry out to God. And no greater place than to go when we need help is to the Father and to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, crying out to God. Letter T was we looked at the thought of taking our thoughts captive and uh, making sure that our, our thought life is in obedience to God and to God's will. Letter O we looked at was to observe the omnipresence of God, remembering that God is with us everywhere we go. And what, what is it that we've allowed Jesus Christ to experience? And the, the things in our life that hinder us is things that we, if we remember that he's with us, I believe that will help us to gain victory over that. And then uh, letter R, I drew a blank. Right away. Run away from sin. Thank you. I drew a blank run and I and I didn't jot it down. I was trying to do it from memory to see if I could remember and I drew a blank. I should have jotted it down. And so I'm too young to be forgetting things already. And so, uh, but letter R last week was to run away from sin, to avoid it, to not pass by it, to flee from it and to get as far away from it as we possibly can. If we see it coming, we go away. I, as I mentioned, you know, last week in the illustration, if I walk out that door and there happened to be a rattlesnake curled up outside that door, I'm not going anywhere near it. I'm going out the bottom door, going around the parking lot and getting in my car and leaving. The door's going to stay unlocked and the snake can have the church because I'm not coming back here until that snake is gone. And so I'm running from it. I'm getting away from it. And so that's the idea with sin. And then tonight as we conclude, I believe that all of those could really be summed up in this one area of our lives. But yet it's probably one of the ones that is the first thing we ought to do and perhaps maybe one of the last things we do. And it is this, yielding ourselves to the Spirit. Yielding ourselves to the Spirit. Yielding ourselves to the Spirit's control. You know, the, the word yield is not uncommon to you and I today. Because it's something that we see quite often. Uh, I've noticed on some of the roads around here in Rio Doso, we don't actually have stop signs. We have yield signs. That word yield simply means to allow or to concede, to permit or to submit. I mean, when you think about those in, rela in our relationship to Jesus Christ, how true that phrase is to, to allow Jesus Christ full control of our lives, to concede unto him, to allow him or to permit him to control our lives and then to submit to his authority, to submit to his leadership, to submit to his direction in our lives. Just as the yield sign, when you approach it, if the yield sign is facing you, 
you are to slow down, and if there's another car coming, you yield the right of way to them. And you allow them to pass first and allow them to go in front of you. And, and it would do us well this evening to allow Jesus to go in front of us. To allow Jesus to control us. To allow Jesus to have uh, full reign of our bodies. And so, as we think about this tonight, I, I pray that it will be a help to us and an encouragement to us as well. Let's open up in a word of prayer this evening. And then we'll get into the matter of the message this evening. Our Father, we come before you and we're grateful for each one of these that have come out tonight to be a part of this midweek service. Father, may they receive a blessing from being in your house. But Father, more so than just a blessing, may you challenge us from your word. May you convict us from the word of God today. And most importantly, Father, I pray that if there's some area of our lives that is brought to the front of our minds tonight, that we are wayward in, that, Father, we might seek out a change in our lifestyle, that, Father, we may seek to live closer to you, that, Father, we would yield to the Spirit's control tonight, and that, Father, we might gain victory over things in our life that we need to gain victory over. Father, bless now as we enter into your word. Bless through it, and we'll give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory for what you'll do. For it's in thy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go with me tonight to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. As we consider this thought of yielding to the Spirit, there are a couple of things that we must take note of tonight. A couple of thoughts. The first thing that I want you and I to consider tonight and for you and I to remember this evening is this one simple fact that you and I have been bought by Jesus Christ and we do not belong to ourselves. We belong unto Jesus Christ. He owns us. He paid for us through his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Notice with me 1 uh, Corinthians chapter number 6. Look at verses 19 and 20. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? Notice these words, And ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It would do us well this evening if we would just remember the reality tonight that we already belong to God. He owns us. We, we, we don't control ourselves. He ought to be the one controlling us. This submitting to the leadership of Jesus Christ, you and I submitting ourselves, yielding ourselves to the Spirit's control would, would be a whole lot easier for us to realize when we remember that, hey, He already purchased us. He owns us. And if He owns me, then He can do with me as He so chooses to. There's nothing I can do to stop what God wants to do in my life. If God desires to take me out of this world, He has that right to do so. But if God so chooses to leave me here on this earth and allow me to live till I'm 70 or 80 or 90 years of age, then He has that right to do so because He owns me. And He owns you tonight for you are bought with a price. Just as you buy, uh, buy something, you own that. You have purchased that with your own money. If, if somebody comes in and takes that from you, that's called stealing. Because that was your item. You owned it. You bought it. You paid for it. You can do with it as you see fit. If you decide sometime after you buy an item that you decide you don't want it and you want to sell it in a garage sale, you have that authority to do that because it's your item. Much like... I think there's a bug flying around me. He keeps landing on me, or I'm seeing stuff, one of the two, I don't know. <laughs> but he owns us tonight, and we have been bought with the price. And it would just help us out to realize that, hey, when I think about the fact that I belong to him, it makes it a whole lot easier to submit to his leadership when I realize, hey, he's already done paid for me. Right. He's bought me. I'm going to use this word, and it may not be the right word, Maybe we're a slave to Jesus. Yeah. He's our master. Amen. 
He owns us. He's bought us. He's paid for us. Therefore, it's my responsibility to serve him and to live for him. He's bought us with a cross. And then note, but notice what he said. Glorify God in your what? Your body. So every ounce of our lives are to be about glorifying God because he has bought us. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Look with me at the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse number 6. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse number 6. Notice what the Bible said. Here's what is said to the nation of Israel. And I believe that even though it's an Old Testament truth, I believe it's applicable to you and I today as God's people in the day and time in which we live to the Christian. The, the wording is this. In verse 6 of Deuteronomy 32, Do ye thus requite the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that hath bought thee? Hath he not made thee and established thee? Not only has he bought us, but he's the one who made us. So, in essence, we're doubly owned by God. He made us. He's the one that gave us life, so we belong to him anyway because he created life. But then he turned around and paid for us and bought us again. So now we were doubly owned by God, if you would. Man, that, that ought to excite us that God has full control. God has every ounce of our life, and there's nothing we can do to stop the will of God. We ought to just go ahead and say, Lord, you have my best interest in mind. I'm going to go ahead and yield to you today. I want to yield my life to you. He is the one who made us. He's the one who has bought us. It's interesting that there's a verse in Scripture that I like to quote to my wife quite often. And uh, she quotes it to me too. And I don't like it as much when she quotes it to me. <laughs> Barbie cannot stand it. She cannot stand being pushed and picked on. And when people tap her. And so occasionally I will get in this ornery spirit. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And I'll go to poker, and she'll tell me she goes, "Don't touch me." So I always like to quote to her First Corinthians chapter number seven and verse number four, where the Bible tells us that the wife hath not power over her own body. And I tell her, I said, your body's not yours, it belongs to me, so I can poke you if I want to. <laughs> so one day she did something to me, and I said, don't touch me. She goes, it's not your body. Look at the rest of that verse, and it says, nor does the husband have power over his own body. I hate when she uses scriptures against me. It's okay for me to do it. You don't use them against me. But you know, as I thought about that, I was reminded of the fact that God said that I don't have power over my own body. In the husband and wife relationship, that she has power over me and vice versa. But the real truth of that is this, that none of us have power and control over our own bodies. God has full control. Amen. God already has the control, so we might as well just relinquish the control that we want to have, thinking that we know better about ourselves and just say, Lord, take my life and use it. You know more about me than I do. You know more about what, what, is, what is in me than I do. I want you to look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Not at that verse, because I've already listed it, but further down in this chapter. Look at 1 Corinthians. Let, let, look at verse 22, first of all. What the Bible says. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant. If you're here tonight and you're saved, you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You are a servant of Jesus Christ. That word servant somewhat carries with it the idea of a, of a slave. You're to serve him. You're to work for him to do what he asks. 
But notice what it says about the servant of the Lord. It is, is the Lord's what? Freeman. Likewise, also he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Even though you're a servant of Jesus Christ, you're free. And then as a free man, you're a servant according to that verse. But I like verse number 23. Ye are bought with the price. Be not ye the servants of men. What does Joshua say? Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of the Amorites or the one true God. Who are we going to serve today? The Bible says that we can't serve both. We have to make a choice in our lives to either yield to the Spirit or to withhold from the Spirit. But I believe it would do us well, just as I, as I said earlier, to remember that we are bought by Christ and not our own. So what does that mean for you and I? Well, secondly, the second thought of yielding to the Spirit is that we must die to flesh and fleshly deeds. Every day, we have to die to this old sinful nature, which is the flesh. Each and every one of us still have a fleshly nature that we battle with every day. I, you know, it would have been so much nicer and as a Christian to not have to deal with that flesh anymore. But the Lord didn't take the flesh away when he saved us. The flesh is still there. And the flesh and the spirit, the Bible said, are at war one, one against another. That they lust one against another. They're always at battle one against another. The flesh is always telling us to do wrong. The spirit's telling us to do right. See, the spirit will tell you you need to read your Bible. The body will tell you, man, I'm too tired. The spirit, will, the, 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 the spirit will tell you you need to pray more. The flesh will tell you you're doing just fine. It's always something to that nature. The spirit will tell you that you need to be in the house of God. The flesh will tell you, man, I ache. I hurt. Or whatever the case may be. See, there's the warring against one or the other. Spirit will tell you, hey, you see that individual out there on the street? Why don't you go hand on the gospel track? The flesh will tell you, you're too scared. They're going to say no, so why bother? They're going to tell you what you want to hear and then go on and do their other things, so why bother? That's what's going on in this, in this life. And you're looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about, it kind of feels like, but I, I know I'm telling the truth this evening. Amen. Because we, we all face it. We all deal with it. We all deal with that internal struggle. So how do we yield completely to the Spirit's control in that? Well, the Bible gives us that answer when, when it says that we have to crucify the flesh. We have to crucify the deeds. We have to do what we can. And, and let me just say this. We, we will never gain victory in our lives doing it ourselves. Right. We will fail every time. I cannot vigilantly guard against sin myself. I will fall into sin, and so will you. I will not imagine the consequences of my sin when I'm looking at it from a fleshly perspective because I'm going to do what the flesh does, and so will you. I won't cry out to God of my own accord. The flesh I'm talking about. We won't cry out to God. We'll try to fix the problems ourselves. We won't take our thoughts captive. We'll let our thoughts run wild in and of ourselves. We won't observe the omnipresence of God. We'll go on living our lives like we want to, forgetting that God is with us. We won't, we won't run from sin like we ought to. Why? Because the flesh is drawing us to sin of ourselves. But if we'll fully surrender, fully yield to the Spirit's control, allow Him to have complete control of our lives, then I can do all that other stuff. I can then realize, hey, sin exists, and I need to guard against it. I need to, I need to imagine my consequences, cry out to God, take my thoughts captive, observe the omnipresence of God, run from sin. And I can do all that as long as I've got God helping me. As long as we have Jesus Christ helping me. But how am I going to do that? Well, I've got to make a step forward and say, Lord, 
I'm dying to myself today. I'm not doing that today. Man, you know, I've slipped in my Bible reading. I've, I've slipped in my prayer life. I've, 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 I've gotten wrapped up in gossip. I've gotten wrapped up in thinking things about people that I shouldn't think. I've gotten, I, you know, I've, I've done this and I've done that. Father, I am not doing those anymore. I want you to take my thoughts and control them. I want you to take my hands and control them. Look with me at what the Bible says. That here, according to this, that we've got to die to the flesh. Look at Romans chapter number 8, verse number 13. Romans chapter 8, verse number 13. The Bible says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, that word mortify means to put to death. It means to destroy. It means to put off, if you would. And so the Bible says here, again in Romans 8, 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit, notice that again. But if ye through who? The Spirit. It's not about you. It's about the Spirit working in you. Working for you. It's all about the Spirit. That, that, but if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Ye shall live. Well, what are the deeds of the body? Lying. What does the Ten Commandments say? Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not steal. I mean, go down that list. If we were to go over to the book of Galatians... Galatians lists for us the works of the flesh. All of those are the deeds of the flesh. The things that ought not to be in the Christian life. Ought not to be there, but yet often we find them in our own lives. Why? Because of this flesh. But what do we have to do? Well, through the Spirit's help. It's through the Spirit. It's not through me. It's not through you. It's only through the Spirit's help. I need to not do those things. Focus my attention, focus my energy on dying to my flesh and my fleshly deeds. My flesh will try to get me to do things I shouldn't do. Your flesh will try to get you to do things you shouldn't do. We all struggle with the flesh. How do we get over it? Die daily. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. Colossians chapter 3, verse number 5. Colossians 3, 5. Notice that word again. Mortify. To destroy. Crucify. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Hey, there's so much stuff that we can talk about. Maybe, maybe there's something that's going on that maybe you can say, "Well, preacher, I haven't. I, I, you know, I haven't lied. I, I, I read my Bible every day. I, I pray every day. My thought life is fine." Well, let me ask you this: You ever had a bad attitude? Oh, yeah. Ever had a critical spirit? Mm-hmm. Ever had a complaining tongue? I know we've had complaining tongues. <laughs> Because we look at the nation of Israel. nation of Israel had the best that they could have ever had. They've been in bondage to one of the greatest adversaries that they ever knew. That was Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt. And immediately, once they get to the wilderness, what do they start doing? Why don't you bring us out here to let us die? We had it better in Egypt. You know? Even though they had already seen him. Take out the whole Egyptian army in the Red in, in the Red Sea, and yet they still complain. He gave them food from heaven. He gave them water from a rock. I never see water come from a rock, and yet here they are complaining and griping. And yet we, many years later, 
As Christians, we do the very same thing that they did. I can't believe that that happened. I wish, I don't know why people would do that. Because we're people. And you know what? We're sinners. And so sinners do what sinners do, and that's sin. We shouldn't be a we shouldn't be a alarm necessarily. When I look when, when I when I turn on my computer and I read the news, I'm not shocked by anything I see because I know what the driving force is behind it all. It's not it, it, it has nothing to do with racism. It's all sin. Amen. Sin is the driving force behind it all. Sin is man's problem. Sin, sin is the issue that man needs to deal with. We are our own worst enemy. My flesh, your flesh, is your own and my own worst enemy. If, if we could get rid of that little thing, Christian life would be so much easier. But it's not always easy, is it? Because sometimes, to be honest, we get around people we don't always like. And you know, sometimes if we're not careful, I can think wrong thoughts about those people. Even as a pastor, I can be guilty of that. Preaching to myself tonight here. That got to gain some victory over there. How do I do that? I'm dying to myself. We've got to die to ourselves. You might ask yourself, well, preacher, how, how often do we need to die to self? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a very good indication of that. In his writings to the church at, at, at Corinth, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 31. Apostle Paul said here to the church at Corinth, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. I die daily. He wasn't talking about a physical death here. Because nobody can die physically daily. You have one life. Once that life is gone, you don't, you don't reincarnate. You don't come back as something else. Keep saying if that ever happens, I want to come back as my wife's dog. She'll actually love on me, Dan, and care about me. I'm joking. She, she loves me, I think. I guess I'll see you tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll find out after I get home tonight now. <laughs> but dying daily, dying to the flesh, crucifying the flesh daily. You know, I think probably one of the first steps that we ought to do every morning when we wake up is say, Lord, it's not my life, it's yours. I am surrendering my life to you today. Control my thoughts, control my hands, control my feet, control my eyes. Control my tongue. Control my ears. What did the Bible say? Mortify therefore your members. Every, every part of us needs to be under the Spirit's control. I don't want him just to control my mouth, but then, you know, allowing anything and everything to come in through my eyes. Because the things that come in through my eyes, you know what they do? They don't just affect my eyes. They affect my heart as well. They then become to start to affect my mind. And then they can eventually maybe creep out through the tongue as well if I'm not careful. But what is it? This dying to the flesh, dying, crucifying our flesh daily. As the Apostle Paul said, I die daily. That ought to be what we do as Christians as well. Is we say, Lord, it, it's your life. You own me. You bought me. Take my life and use it for your honor and for your glory. And then the third thought, and I kind of dealt with this, I spoke on it just, to, just for a moment there, was the third step in yielding to the Spirit is this. We must surrender to the Spirit's control of every aspect of our life. Notice I said every aspect. He can't just have part of us. He owns us all. He owns everything. My mind, your mind belongs to him. My eyes, your eyes belong to him. My mouth, your mouth belongs to him. My ears, your ears belong to him. My hands, your hands belong to him. My heart, your heart, if you're saved, belong to him. My feet, your feet belong to him. Every aspect of my life, every aspect of our being belongs to him. 
We just need to give him full control over everything. Allow him to have everything. Look with me at the book of 2 Chronicles chapter number 30. 2 Chronicles chapter number 30. And look at verse number 8. says in 2 Chronicles chapter 30 verse number 8 now be ye not stiff necked we don't really use the word stiff necked in our day and time but we have another word for that kind of attitude I call it hard headedness hard headed he says now be ye not stiff necked as your fathers were but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. It's interesting to me that in that verse, there are really three steps to our yielding to Christ. Notice what is said again. Now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto God. Notice the first step is you and I have to make that conscious effort that we are going to surrender and yield ourselves to God. But then notice what God tells them. He doesn't say stay home, does he? Oh, you're, you're fine from the comfort of your own home. You're, 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 you don't have to. Notice what he says. And enter into his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. So not only is this yielding to be done inward of your life, in your heart, but this yielding ought to affect us right here where we're at today, in the very house of God. Enter into a sanctuary. I'm not, I'm not taking that out of context. I'm reading it word for word. Enter into the sanctuary. But then notice what else he says. The third step. And serve the Lord. I believe that's outside the doors of the church. So first of all, yielding. Maybe let's, let, let, let me put it this way. This is a word we'll all get to know. Revival. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. Revive us. You know where revival starts? Revival does not start from these pews. Revival starts in your heart and in my heart. Reviving the work. Reviving you and I. That's what we're talking about. Reviving us to yield ourselves once again to God. Yielding ourselves, first of all, when we say, Lord, I need you to control my life. I, I need you to do it. But then it's also, it needs to be seen here in the house of God. But then it's to be reflected outside the doors as we go out when the Bible says, and serve the Lord your God. Notice what is not in the wording of this verse. There's no duration of time on serving the Lord your God. And serve the Lord God. And serve the Lord your God. When do we get to stop serving God? Never. 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 He says, serve the Lord God. He saved you to serve. He saved us to do things for him. That, that's an open-ended job. You may not necessarily draw a paycheck from it, but really we get way more for serving God than I have ever working for a company. I worked for several companies that I thought I had solid jobs with them, and we went through downhills, and guess what happened? I got laid off because companies went through down times. It's part of life. You may not like it, but it's part of life. You know what it just reminded me of? That to that, to that business, I wasn't really much to them when it came down to it. But to God, we're everything. And the Bible says, serve the Lord God. Give him every ounce of your life. Give him everything from in the heart 
to the church and then outside the church in our service for God, serving God everywhere we go. Look with me at Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter 6. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse number 11, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, notice these words, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm thankful as a Christian we're dead to sin, can be dead to sin, but we're alive unto God. That old man was crucified, that old man was down, we came up a new creature if you would. Sin there is still there, though, because verse 12 says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace." What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked, that ye were the servants of sin, but that ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was, del which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servant of sin, servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Church, we have a choice tonight. Christian, there's a choice that you have to make personally. I can't make it for you, nor can you make it for me. The choice is this tonight. According to the authority of God's word in Romans chapter 6, verse number in Romans chapter 6, the verses we read, there are two choices that every, every person has to make. And that choice is this. Who do you yield to? Do you yield yourself to the Spirit's control? Or do you yield yourself to your own control? I can promise you, trying to control our own lives, we're going to make a mess of it. We'll get into problems. We'll get into trouble, if you will. But I'm thankful that we'll let God have control. God will watch out for us. Because the Bible says, Yield ye your members as servants unto what? Righteousness. Or right living. Well, how do we know what's right living? God's Word has clearly laid out for us what is true. So how do we get victory over sin? Well, I believe the final step sums it all up. Really, this is probably the first step. Yielding ourselves to God. If we'll just first yield our lives to God and give God complete control, die to ourselves, I believe we can have victory over sin. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. Father, help us in our lives.